gonna smash it. There we go. Listen, I'm so sorry, man. Typically, I, I typically the Google thing is a is a worry, but um, but Riverside is it. What's what's beautiful about Riverside, and I'll have to look at Zoom and how it performs now. But what Riverside does is it actually um, records your audio on your side. It doesn't actually record it through the internet. Mm -hmm. And so, so it, better audio, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the audio is amazing, amazing. But um, look, it doesn't matter to me. It's working. Okay. We're recording. I, you know, somebody else is going to ask me to do something on Chrome. I don't know where it stands <laughs> now. I downloaded four times. I downloaded new Chrome. It's in my applications um, folder right there. It's Chrome. And I try and open it and it says, um, go to go to Launchpad and launch. What the fuck is Launchpad? <laughs> and how do I launch it? And so it's I'm stuck right there. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um... If I was there, I'd just sort I sort it out for you. Um, but no, this works. Zoom works, and uh, David Guaman, look, man, I think you'd be f hard pressed to find someone who's spoken more about Monster of God than me. Oh well, thank you very much, Robbie. I appreciate that. Um, big fan of you. Big fan of Monster of God. And as I was, um, one of my the guy that reached out to you, Cody, our uh, podcast producer. Yeah, was like, man. You know, you talk about David Guaman so much. Have you thought about reaching out to him? I was like, is he available? And he Google, he's like, well, here's an email. I'll send an email. And lo and behold, you responded. I was amazed. Easy, easy. easy. I just sit in this room here with these books, with, <laughs> uh, with Boots the Python over there in his tank. And uh, if I'm not traveling somewhere. Well, look, welcome to are the you, are you, podcast. Robbie, are, are you, uh, forgive me for my weakness on, of, of ear but are you australian david Gorman. okay hold on okay new zealand you're you're digging yourself a much bigger hole than you need to right now because okay. my my level of obviously based on what i've just told you my level of esteem for you was way 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 high oh and i just i uh, just ruined it huh oh my god you just kicked me in the nuts twice i am south african but Right. But so that's I, how that's how bad I am. I, that would that would have been my next guess, but <laughs> and I and I shouldn't I should know that. As a matter of fact, I did know that because I googled you a little bit, um, but I just I just forgot because here here's my here's my excuse, Robbie. My brain has been in Tasmania for the last. What are you doing in Tasmania? Are you going off to the thylacine? No, no, I'm doing a book on cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. Wow. And that means, and and it all began for me when I got interested in the devil, the poor Tassie devil, mm -hmm. that's dying of this genuinely contagious cancer. Mm -hmm. And I've gone to I've gone to Tasmania. I don't know, maybe three times in the last thirty years. Uh, um, I love the place. Um, going to South Africa with my wife, by the way, in September. We're going to spend a little time in Cape Town on the way to Mozambique. What are you doing in Mozambique? My wife loves Cape Town, loves mm. Cape Town. Um, Mozambique, I'm going back to Gorongosa National Park. Um, I'm on the board of an organization called Rainforest Trust, awesome. which which gives away millions of dollars a year for the protection of habitat, biological diversity. And, uh, and I have been to Gorongosa before a couple of times for National Geographic to write a piece uh, that's actually in it's in my most recent book, The Heartbeat of the Wild, uh, a piece on this wonderful, wise, mm -hmm. successful restoration project of Gorongosa National Park, uh, protecting the biological diversity, protecting the landscape, and also making it an asset rather than a loss for the the low income people living in the villages in the buffer zone surrounding it. Well, isn't that just a, a, a common sort of denominator that, that, that occurs in these wild places all around the world. And you are probably one that can speak to it more than I can, because you've experienced well, these wild places more than most people. It's a, it's a common idea. It's, it's conventional wisdom now that you have to, um, you have to make, to make conservation by protecting habitat lasting you have to deal with the people. I talk about this in in Monster of God. All those, 
you know, all those big predators. We we sit here and we enjoy the fact that grizzly bears and um, lions and leopards um, still exist. Uh, but it's the people, the low income people, the indigenous people who live on the landscapes among or adjacent to those big predators, you know this is a South African, yep. who pay the costs. And there are costs of preserving big predators. And society needs, here you got me going already, society needs to be ready to pay those costs and not just expect the people right there on the on the scene to pay all of those costs. So uh, this fellow named Greg Carr, an mm -hmm. American multimillionaire, who cares deeply about biological diversity and equally deeply about human rights was asked to partner with the Mozambican government to restore Gorongosa after 17 years of civil war had, had devastated the place. And he's been doing that, working on that since about 2003. I wrote the story about the park project about his Mozambican partners and to some extent about Greg, he has become a friend. And now um, we're going back and Rainforest Trust is having a board meeting there. We have one, one of three board meetings a year we have in some place that actually has biological diversity rather than a <laughs> conference hall in Washington, DC. So uh, that's, that's a that's long amazing. story. So, and, and this time my wife, Betsy, who loves Africa and has spent a lot of time in Africa, she says, oh, I'm going with you this time. I want to see Gorongosa. Let's stop in South Africa. I want to show you Cape Town. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I don't know. You, you Google stalk me, which is uh, flattering, by the way. I appreciate you doing that. Um, my grandfather immigrated to Mozambique in 1954. No kidding. Mm, oh. From Germany. And uh, lived the heyday of Africa and its wildlife and wrote a, a book with Safari Press with all of his sort of anecdotal stories, funny stories, wildlife conservation stories. And he inscribed the front of the book for me. And, you know, he was he was a hunter, but he loved wildlife and he loved fishing more. He was more of a fisherman. Mm -hmm. And on the on the inside of the book, he inscribed. I don't think I have it hanging in here, but on the inside of the book, he inscribed uh, to Robbie a grandson of mine that will be uh, protecting wildlife, unlike the likes of his grandfather and others who decimated wildlife. What a wise man. What a, what a self-seeing man. What was his name? His name was Leo Kroger. Leo Kroger. Yeah. And he hunted with the first hunting operation in Mozambique called, with uh, Werner von Albensleben, um, he was surrounded by the, you know, the Harry Manners of the world, the Wally Johnsons of the world. But here's something that uh, a name that may um, you have probably come across tied to the Gorongosa project. He was very, very good friends with Carlos Pereira. Carlos Pereira. And he is the, I believe Pereira is his last name, or Carlos Lopez, something like that. He is the veterinarian. He was the veterinarian for Mozambique and then went over the, to the um private side working for wwf he is the man he won the tusk award he's he's a portuguese man gray beard is your grandfather still living no sir he died in 2000 and 2004 i was in this country for a year and um i went back to see him he, he died of uh blood cancer and um but he was such a sort of cantankerous curmudgeon that in the hotel in the hospital room as he was dying he had little gin bottles in the little refrigerator in the, in the, in the hospital room and he smoked he was smoking in the hospital room and i said you're not allowed to do that in here and he says who's going to stop me i've been smoking for 90 years and the nurse has just opened the windows and closed the door leo kroger yes sir what a man he sounds wonderful he was an and amazing man we, we have something in common when my dear sweet irish mother Irish German actually mother was dying at the age of 91 in hospice the hospice people allowed her to have a gin bottle in the freezer in the communal <laughs> freezer and when I visited there and I was I was there with my two sisters the moment she died I was holding her hand we saw her through this in hospice at Christmas time of 2008 
up until about the last five days, I was able to make a martini for her and for me each evening with the gin from the refrigerator at the hospice. And it and it had not only did the hospice people say, of course you can put a bottle of gin for your mother in the refrigerator or the freezer. It should be the freezer, but um and not only that, but they they took a piece of tape and they wrote on it, Mary, my mother's name. <laughs> Nobody steal this. Anyway, that's I, I love hearing about Leo Kroger. Mm, it was an amazing man. Um when you go to Tasmania, are you a fly fisherman? You live in Bozeman, Montana, as I understand. You know, I am a I'm a I'm a retired fly fisherman. <laughs> You shouldn't be retired. You're going to like the one of the brown trout capitals of the world in Tasmania. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but uh, I was I was never a hunter, as I've told you. Yeah. But I, I, I was raised as a fisherman. My father was a fisherman and not a hunter. So I became a fisherman and not a hunter. I moved to Montana in 1973 with the Volkswagen bus, an electric typewriter, boxes of penguin paperbacks and a cheap fly rod and taught myself to fly fish and was passionate about it and studied aquatic insects and learned to tie flies and taught fly tying and learned to wrap rods and built a couple of rods for myself and was a fishing guide, was a licensed fishing guide and then I got to a point where I couldn't be a fishing guide anymore because I loved the trout far more than I liked my clients. <laughs> and a fishing guide or a hunting guide, I'm sure, yep. who who loves the prey more than he loves the client yep. needs to get in a different line of work. That's right. And so you became however, a writer. However much he loves the prey. However yeah. much he loves the prey. Uh, and... Um, so, well, I was already a writer at that point. I, I had published one novel and I was trying to get back into print, trying to figure out how to make a living as a writer, which I had not done with my first novel. And my second and third efforts at novels were not good enough to be published. So I spent 13 years paying my dues between the first. Do you want to hear? Is this? Am I no, just this is no, no, no. You're right. Because you know what? This is no, no. You're fine. Because this is part of the story. I live my, this day in, day out. My wife is an author. My my version of the story that you probably investigate and tell a lot, which is how does this particular person relate to a love of wildlife, fishing, hunting? How are those connected with becoming a conservationist, mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. alone a writer? The writing part is not particularly important. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I was a fishing guide during those years when I was paying my dues. And I happened to pay my dues between the first book and the second book rather than before the first yeah, book. Yeah. My wife is a um my wife is a a published author. She's published two nonfiction books. She has a PhD in 18th century Gothic literature. So she is a horror writer, horror and psychological thriller writer. That's a good start. Yeah. And uh yeah, she's got two nonfiction books out. The first one was called Monster, she wrote which is all about how the, the horror genre was built on the backs of women and it was biographies of 40 women from the 1700s to today. But that yeah, sounds, you're right. That sounds fascinating. I think, um, what's the second one? Second one's called Toil and Trouble. It's about spiritualism and the occult and how those ties in with uh, essentially woman gothic. Um, and, a, a bit... and with Macbeth? Exactly. And the joke is, look, Robbie, you don't, from my wife, she says, look, you don't ever have to worry about you know, showing up dead somewhere because the first person they're going to turn to is me and just look at my Google search history because I'm trying to learn how to kill people all day long, you know, so I'll be implicated immediately. So I'll be protecting you. <laughs> Good for her. Good honor. Uh, David, you know, you've been obviously Monster of God is is my first introduction to you. Um, I'm just, again, from a, a curiosity perspective, when you built that book, did you go around the world and, and hit these different areas, go and spend time in each of these areas? Yes. Yeah, I did. I did. That book began because I had gotten very interested in the Asiatic lion, the surviving population in the gear forest yep. uh, in Western India. 
And I had gone over there. I'd gotten interested in that, I think, first when I was writing a book called The, the Song of the Dodo, which is about evolution and extinction on islands around the world and what we have learned from the study of island populations about evolution and extinction generally. And I was quite I was quite excited when I saw in the 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 heartbeat is it the heartbeat of the wild this Absolutely. latest book yeah, yeah. I, I actually when I, when you said yes to coming on here I was like oh my gosh I need an Amazon Prime it to me in two days and I didn't get through it all but I did get through the forward and you're talking about you know the theory of island biogeography yeah. which is something yeah. a class that I took uh, through my PhD um, in and right. it is it's exactly right. right you know islands around the world are represented not only as islands but represented as these habitat fragments that we're starting yeah. to see everywhere. Yeah, with names like um, Kruger and Yellowstone. Correct. Correct. Um, those are those are among the best of the islands because they're the biggest mm -hmm. human-made islands of protected habitat. Um, anyway, um, the Gear Forest in Gujarat of Western India is an island of of classic Indian subcontinent dry forest, uh, surrounded by humans, struggling, hungry, desperate humans doing agriculture and industry. And here's this little patch of forest with about 200 Asiatic lions and um, indigenous people known as Maldaris raising water buffalo in this forest among the lions. So I got interested in that first because it was an island, an insularization situation. And after I had spent time there with um, an Indian man who became a, a dear friend of mine, Ravi Chellam, a wildlife biologist, trained at the Wildlife Institute of India in Dehradun, uh, who did his PhD on the lions of gear, these these lions, the easternmost population of lion, mm -hmm. uh, um, of sp a species that formerly was distributed all throughout the southwestern Asia, as well as Africa. Uh, Ravi Chellam had done his PhD on them. He became my source, my guide. I saw the lions over his shoulder and uh, wrote a, a longish magazine piece as well as maybe part of my book, The Song of the Dodo, about them, I can't remember. But then I, I real, I, I guess not. I guess this was a little bit after The Song of the Dodo. Um, but I was there at, at this little hotel in the Gear Forest with Ravi, and one day it occurred to me, I should write a book about this. I should write a book about big predators. I should mm -hmm. write a book about the Asiatic lion in the forest of Gear and some other big predators that live in landscapes that are also occupied by humans, preferably, for my interest, um, indigenous peoples, and write about the importance of big, dangerous, occasionally man-eating predators and the people who live close to them and the difficulty, the tension that that, that creates, the the tension between the the predators' needs and and the people's needs, and how that is being dealt with or not dealt with in certain places around the world. So then I I picked out four cases of what I labeled alpha predators, and I defined this this artificial category alpha predators, a, a species of predator that's big enough, fierce enough, and solitary enough such that a single individual of that animal can and occasionally does kill and eat a human. So the, the sharpest point of the spear in terms of wildlife human conflict. Mm. And so I chose the saltwater crocodile in Northern Australia, the Asiatic lion in Western India, the, um, the tiger in the Russian Far East, uh, some people call it the Siberian tiger. Some mm -hmm. people call it the, the Amur tiger, a subspecies of tiger. And then the, the brown bears in the Carpathian Mountains. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. of, of Romania. So I so I spent 
I think that book took me about five years. I was doing other things. I was doing magazine work for National Geographic. Uh, I had a marriage that was unfortunately coming unraveled, apparently. I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And I would bounce from an assignment for National Geographic, walking across the Congo with an explorer. The absolutely nuts. That, the Fay Mega Transect with Mike Faye is absolutely Mike So I was doing that at the same time. So I would I would go to the Congo for National Geographic, and I'd spend 10 days or two weeks walking through the forest with this explorer conservationist, Mike Faye, um, in sandals and river shorts and sleeping on the ground and and bashing our way, not bashing our way, picking our way through the forest, off trail, away from humans, away from roads, um, uh, because he was censusing what was there. Mm -hmm. And I would finish 10 days or so of doing that. And because we were wearing sandals and shorts so that we go, could cross through swamps and rivers and things like that, uh, my feet would be all sort of torn up with scratches and cuts and things. I would fly up to Paris, check into a cheap hotel in uh, the African neighborhood of, the, I think, the 16th arrondissement, and spend three days or so healing my feet, eating well, which I did not do on this walk through the Congo, eating well, healing my feet in Paris, walking around the city, and then I would fly to Romania to connect with my brown bear biologist friends, wow. spend another two weeks researching uh, the brown bears of Romania, of which there are many, many, many. It's a wonderful survival, wonderful, weird survival story. And then I would fly home and no wonder, you know, my mm -hmm. wife was deciding that she was done with me. Mm -hmm. Did Have you kept up with... Um the various populations and what they're doing today? Um, not in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. The gear lion, I'm, I'm, I'm still in touch with my friend Ravi Chellum, so I hear about what's going on with the gear lion. Um, the, um, the tiger in the Russian Far East, I'm still in touch with um, a fellow named Dale McKell, an American who was running that project, so I know a little bit about what's going on there. I've lost touch with my, well, I don't know if I've lost touch, but my my communications with my friends in Romania have lapsed, so I mm -hmm. don't know the latest what that's going on there. And uh, the saltwater crocodile, um, I have every reason to believe that it's thriving because they did thriving. what was necessary. Thriving, yeah. absolutely thriving. Yeah. Um, did you have any other considerations as you built that book to other alpha predators that should be included that you're like, hmm? I want to constrain it to the full. Yeah, I thought about others. I mean, I thought about sharks. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's some species of shark uh, that are, you know, noted for occasionally picking off a human. Yep. Uh, I decided. I decided that that would be difficult. For one thing, I'm not a diver. Well, I've I've been certified as a diver, but I I don't haven't dived with yep. any sort of consistency um what about a so polar I, bear i thought about a polar bear and i was very tempted because i love polar bears i mean polar bears are fascinating and since then there's a little bit of polar bear in this new book the heartbeat of the wild mm -hmm. one story about an expedition to the russian arctic where um where I, I had some experiences with polar bears amazing polar bears are amazing creatures uh, yeah. one of the things that amazes me most about them is you see them portrayed, and 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 you'll know this, Robbie. You see it. Somebody does a painting or a sculpture of a big white bear, and you can tell whether they really know polar bears or not because of the neck. Mm -hmm. Because a polar bear has a neck like a snake, mm -hmm. and for the same reason that my pal Boots, the ball python in that tank, um, has has a long neck so he can strike it's what polar bears do to seals when they surface in a in a hole in the ice that's right, right? yep that's right so I, I i love everything that i know about polar bears but i did not have a handle on someone who was studying them dealing with them in the context of indigenous people uh, otherwise it would have been a perfect choice it would have been a good choice and i would have loved doing yeah, it'd it. be a great choice today you know the 
obviously with climate change and more and more, you know, the the narrative around polar bears, you know, that there's the 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 populations are diminishing. You go and speak with these Inuits and you go speak with the First Nations. It's like, man, we we're seeing more bears than ever. And yeah. we're having more and more problems with them. Yeah. It'd be yeah. interesting to see today what that would look like. It would have been great to if you had picked up polar bears then what it looks like today. The same reason like the Carpathian Mountains, the uh information I'm getting out of Romania is that you know brown bears doing extremely, extremely well. And yeah. human yeah. wildlife conflict is obviously increasing because human populations are increasing, just like any other wildlife around the world, elephants, yeah. anything. Humans yeah. increase, habitats being restricted, habitats are being reduced, as well as the animal population increasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that things sound, still sound good in, in Romania. Romania had some, as you know from reading my book, um, Monster of God, Romania had a, a very unique situation that was awful in a lot of ways. They had a they had an idiot, um, murderous dictator named Ceausescu during the communist era, and he fancied himself a hunter. He was not a fair chase hunter. You've you've read how he hunted in, yep. in my book. Yep. It was everything that hunting shouldn't be and that um, conscionable hunters deplore. Um, a man who didn't earn his kills in any fair chase way but who killed a lot of bears but wouldn't let anyone else kill bears mm -hmm. so he had the whole forest department of romania um growing brown bears for his pleasure yep and sending uh, them his way sending them his way luring them baiting them into these stands where he could come get out of a helicopter walk a hundred yards go into a little cabin stick his rifle out of a shooting slot and there would be a a horse carcass hung up to attract bears and then he would pop the bears that came mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the, the the good side of that was once once the romanian people managed to depose him and put him up against a wall with his wife and finish them with ak-47s uh, they had all this protected forest right. and these protected bears right did you know your explanation of why you picked what you picked is actually fascinating to me because one of the things I, I I constantly use your book in the reference of is wolves, and um, obviously being a pack animal and not an individual animal that has the the propensity of killing an, an a, you know large sized human adult that makes sense, but I think it's important for you to sort of know what I constantly talk about, and I think this is a thread through your book whether consciously put there, probably consciously put there, is this affinity between humans and alpha predators in that we live on the same trophic level mm -hmm. as these alpha predators. Right. And I use it in the context of wolves because, dare I say, there isn't an animal on this planet. There are a couple that elicit more of an emotional response from humans. Right. On both ends of the spectrum, you can go from a zero degree to 180, and you've got two sides of the argument. Right. And what I say is this, is that I, I, you know, from your book, I say, you know, we're all alpha predators. I'm an alpha predator, and I see a wolf as an alpha predator. And humans do the same thing. And you have humans on one side of the spectrum that see themselves in the wolf. They see themselves in terms of the characteristics, the leader, the pack leader, the alpha male, alpha female taking care of the pack, um, the intelligence, the, the the charisma when you stare into their eyes. And that creates this sort of deity within this cadre of humans. Mm -hmm. Well, then you swing all the way to the other side and there's an inherent competitiveness between a human alpha predator and whether that's tribal genetic coming from way back in the day and us being alpha predators and saying, well, they, they're just like us and I'm a competitor against them and I'm going to do everything that I can to subdue them because yeah. that's just who we are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And as an element that an additional element in that relationship um, which you know I'm, you're aware of too, and that is, like these alpha predators, we d 
depend on herbivores for meat. Right. And when we replace their natural prey with our domesticated herbivores on the landscape, they have to eat something. So if the if the the wild herbivores are gone, ungulates and others, then these predators will prey on whatever other big standing pieces of you know gullible meat are there and that means our domestic livestock so there's that's the conflict point um the conflict between uh you know um various species of wild antelope on the south african landscape and cows are the flashpoint for the conflict between humans and lions mm -hmm. or wolves mm -hmm. or or hyenas um and and likewise in Romania likewise here in Montana etc right that's mm -hmm. that that's sort of where it begins is when you know humans don't move into a landscape and say we want to kill all the predators they move into a landscape and say um we want to eat meat we've killed all the buffalo um we want to raise cows we want to raise sheep so we start doing that and then lo and behold these predators come and start taking picking off our livestock so so we hate them and we we want to eradicate them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm using we in the absolutely very oddest sense mm -hmm. david you you mentioned earlier and you, you you were very uh when you emailed me and saying yeah i'm good to go but i just want to let you know i'm not a hunter and i said man that's even better for us when it comes to conversations we like to have. Um, you are not a hunter because you weren't raised a hunter? Uh, that's the that's the first reason and probably the most important reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in Southern Ohio. My father was from Wisconsin. Uh, he had never been a hunter, but he loved to fish and he taught me to fish and he took me on fishing trips in the wilderness of, you know, uh, of Canada, the Quetico Forest of Ontario, some wonderful formative. He took me up there when I was 14 years old in 1962. Mm -hmm. Life-changing experience, you know, being in the in a canoe in the in the back country with my father for um for a week, uh living on living on fish, living on the fish that we caught and the beans Amazing. that we caught. Um and uh so that was that was formative and that prepared me to become a very, very passionate fly fisherman for a number of years until I wasn't anymore. And it just never happened. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've gone out with friends, um, walking, walking with friends for bird hunting. I've gone out with a friend, um, hunting for mountain lions with his dogs, skiing in the winter. Um, a fellow who I became friends with because I had written something negative about the hunting of mountain lions that maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, I, I, I literally said, well, I, I see two problems. I'm not against hunting, but I see two problems with hunting mountain lions. First of all, I think hunters um, should eat what they kill. And secondly, I don't think there are enough mountain lions uh, for us to be hunting them in Montana. And I published that and I heard back from this fellow in Lewistown, Montana, saying, listen, Kwame, you ignorant yuppie. Uh, uh, Come out with me. You're wrong on both. You're wrong on both counts. Yeah. So I've written about this, I guess. Don Thomas is his name. Wonderful man. And he said. Uh, come come out with me if you want to learn how wrong you are on both counts. There are a lot of mountain lions in these hills. And when I kill a mountain lion, I eat it. Mm hmm. So come up and go go hunting with me and I'll feed you mountain lion. And it was sort of a, you know, sort of a challenge, sort of a sarcastic challenge. I called him up immediately and said, when can I come? When do we leave? And so I went up there and we went out with his dogs. We didn't we didn't raise a mountain lion when I was out with him. I went out two different times over the course of several years. Uh, it was never a day to pick up a mountain lion track. Uh, but he did feed me mountain lion and and i ate it and it was pretty good the way he david, cooked it david isn't that a, a kudos to you number one kudos to you to say huh let me just see what this is about and number two isn't and then that i wrote another piece. society 
Isn't that well, the symptom me, of society? Yeah. Let me just finish and say, then I, after I was up there and he fed me a mountain, then I wrote another magazine piece and said, here's what I said before. Here's how wrong I was. Here's how I learned I was wrong. Here's the wonderful man who showed me who is now my friend. David, you are, that is what we do every single day. Like it's, and you know, sometimes it's ignorance, but sometimes for the majority, it's, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. You know, when you talk about hunting, when we talk about hunting and the way that it protects habitats and protects wildlife and has grown wildlife populations, which is a paradox that is very, very difficult for someone to understand, right? You are purporting to love wildlife. You purport to, to, to care the animal, but you kill it. Yet, how can killing an animal actually increase its population? It's really mind boggling for someone who doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And we say it all the time. Don't believe me. Just come. Come see for yourself. Mm -hmm. I have outfitters all over the world who will take you and they will show you. Mm -hmm. And just like you, your eyes will be opened. Because it's so difficult in today's day and age. You're a, you're a journalist. You're, you're an author, a writer. Anybody in today's day and age can write anything they want. And people don't do their research anymore. They just believe hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, that said, um, there are situations, there are hunting situations that I've seen that I don't, you know, I don't like, I don't approve of. There are, well, I talked about Ceausescu in Romania. Right. right. That's the most extreme case. Mm-hmm. There are other places where um, where there's trophy hunting by wealthy people who fancy themselves doing something good for hunting simply because they're paying a lot of money mm -hmm. to get a trophy. That does not necessarily equate to benefit for the local population of lion or elephant or, or whatever it is. Yeah, in those situations, the way that I like to couch it is it's difficult to change someone's motivation, right? Mm -hmm. They could be really rich and they want to come in and they want to kill a really old lion. They want to kill an, a big old elephant. Okay. Both of those probably are something that I don't want to hunt, but I get it. It's your, it's your reason and your motivation. And your motivation is to do that. Your motivation is not conservation. But what I have to look at is, okay, what, are, what comes from it? What comes from someone paying $150,000 for a hunt like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I look at the anti poaching efforts in, you know, in many, many big landscapes like Tanzania, where you can. And I look at the. I the was thinking of Tanzania too. Just yeah. Now. The game, you know, the game trail camera footage that I see of lions that have been looked at since they were five years old and are 10 years old when they're taken. It's, it's the care and the stewardship of the resource that they realize like, man, we need to look after this place. And yes, we take one line, two lines a year, but it's very, very discriminant in terms of and very selective in what they take. But the benefits, oh my God, the benefits of schools and clinics and anti-poaching and the thousands of wildlife that is well, that's where the That's where the devil is in the details though, right, 100%. Robbie? 100%. The issue is who gets that $150,000? Does the government get that? And what does the government do with it? How much Agreed. of it is turned off? Uh, you know, in by you know outfitters, how much do their employees get? How much do the local people get? It has to be done right. And the last time I spent any time looking at the lion in Tanzania, over the shoulder of a great lion biologist named Craig Packer, yep, uh, who had supported trophy hunting in Tanzania for decades. He had a thirty-year database on lions of the Serengeti. Um, Eventually, Craig, if I re recall the details correctly, was forced out of Tanzania because he he came to feel that the benefits, again, talking about who pays the benefits and who, who gets the benefits and who pays the cost, um, the benefits of those trophy hunts were not going enough to support protection of habitat. Mm -hmm. and reproductive lions at, mm -hmm. and the people who live among them mm -hmm. at the local level and too much was going going off the top into the big pockets yeah no you look the you the, you're certainly right and some of that happens but i will say based on the people that i've seen 
and the people I've interacted with. When you start uh, a system, for instance, I don't know how it's changed and when it changed, but when you have a system where someone leases a piece of concession for five years at a time, the amount of investment that goes in initially for you potentially losing it in five years, those kinds of situations are not ever going to be good for wildlife, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're like, wow, in five years time, I may lose it all. So I don't give us stuff. We're just going to rape and pillage kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, these guys are now getting 10 year leases, 15 year leases. And they're like, okay, now it becomes an economic endeavor, which is we need to and, 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 you know, Tanzania has various different and, and Mozambique and Namibia, and all the, they have different levels of percentages that go to the local governments and whatnot. And I think one of the things that I, I often face from an argument perspective is people like, oh, these guys, they make too much money. And I said, well, you know, it's an economic endeavor, right? So they're going to have to make some sort of profit. Mm -hmm. And we've got to figure out like people are allowed to make money. And they're allowed to make a profit because it is a business. But there's also a reinvestment from these guys' perspective to say, well, my profit needs to go back into anti-poaching, needs to go back into school based on the management plan that I've now executed with the Tanzanian government, go back into clinics. It's amazing. And again, that's my job, right? My job today is to is the devil's in the details to say, look, I don't think anybody knows that there's 30 plus medical clinics in Tanzania that are funded by hunting totally why do they do that oh because that's part of the plan that's they have to and where does that money come from that money comes from the profits mm -hmm. from somebody coming to hunt you know yeah. and that person coming to hunt isn't motivated by oh i'm i'm helping a clinic that person is coming to hunt because they want to kill a big lion or a big leopard or or a big elephant yeah yeah well that's a that's a really precious function that you perform um policing that sort of situation with the spotlight of public communication mm -hmm. where is it be being done right where is it not being done right mm -hmm. where are the situations where those 30 clinics have been built mm -hmm. uh, where those schools have been built and where are the places where that hasn't happened and and where the outfitters is just taking taking a, a huge profit and not reinvesting yeah yeah uh, that's a that's a i i salute that function the function you're performing there robbie it, it, you know if you're if you're you know casting the spotlight of intelligent um scrutiny of the real on the ground dynamics on these situations yeah, and look, there are bad apples in every industry, right? Unfortunately, um, and the bad apples in the hunting industry, unfortunately, raise a lot more eyebrows than any other industry because of you know the unscrupulousness of it, uh, yeah, and the unethicalness of it. Um, but the vast majority of the people that I've met are in it for you know even across the world, even in Colorado, when you talk about mountain lions. There's a big, big thing coming down the pipeline in Colorado right now where people are wanting to ban mountain lion hunting and bobcat hunting, even though the science shows that there's been a sustainable, healthy mountain lion population for 30 years mm -hmm. through consumptive take. And um, and when you speak to people, we've actually built a I'll, – after this, we get off this, I want to send you two pieces of of, of some things that I've done. One is a lion, is a lion documentary. We've done a, a documentary on lion houndsmen in the West. Mm -hmm. One is a guy's out of Montana, a couple out of Nevada, one out of Utah, and one out of Wyoming. Is it my friend Don Thomas? It isn't. Is a guy called Tyler Johnerson. Um, phenomenal houndsman, and these guys just love their dogs, and just like Don did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've got that piece that I'd love to share with you, and then I've got another piece in Zimbabwe called Wyan Water. That's about someone going into a community and saying, what do you need? Nobody's mm -hmm. looking after you here. You can't even pay the federal taxes of the land that was given back to you by the government. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, we just need wire for our cows and to keep other people's cows away. Mm -hmm. And we need wire for our vegetable gardens and we need water. We need water for our people and we need water for our cows. Mm 
Wire and Water. Yeah. And it's a it's a great piece. It actually has won nine different uh, film awards right now in the film festival space. Wow. Um, wow. And I'd love to share both of them with you so you can see okay. a, again a, an idea of, of of what we do. Um, I just, you know, I'm cognizant of time. I know we're pushing on 11 o'clock and that's when my promised time allotment was with you. Um, David, well, I'm just, I'm a big fan of yours, as you know. And um, thank you. Thank you very much, Robbie. And I hope that um, we can stay in touch after this because I think your thought processes, let me ask this. I'll, ask, I'll, I'll end with one last question because you've been <laughs> around the world dealing with wildlife issues. What's the future look like, David? And, you know, what do we need? What is like the primary thing that you see that's like, I see this over and over and over again when it comes to sort of protecting wildlife? Well, um, I believe in hope. Uh, I believe that hope is not is not a mood. It's not a psychological condition. It's a duty. Um, and uh, it's not a matter of optimism or pessimism what do you guess the future may be i think people have a duty to be hopeful because without hope you have despair and with that and with despair you have indifference and then it's all just eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die and let it, everything go to hell uh, we mustn't do that uh, so we need to be hopeful that said um the trends um are are very dire, as we all know. Um, and here's the way I see it. We have three huge human-caused problems on this planet. Some people say, oh, it, everything is contained within climate change. Some young people have the impression because they've been hearing about it for now for 20 years, climate change, climate change, climate change. I say something about loss of biological diversity, the extinction crisis. Oh, that's caused by climate change, isn't it? <laughs> I say something about disease, the emergence of new viruses. Oh, that's, is that, tell us how climate change causes that. Well, be calm, young people, and listen to me while I say that climate change is hugely important, but it's not the only hugely important problem, and it does not encompass the other hugely important problems, it is parallel to them. We have three great rivers of woe, three churning, brown, roiling rivers of trouble, one of which is climate change, one of which is loss of biological diversity, one of which is the emergence of new diseases, particularly viruses from wildlife, that are flowing parallel to one another, with some channels braiding among them yes interconnecting them where are these all coming from they're coming from a snowfield on a great mountain that is melting and feeding these three rivers a great single snowfield what's causing that snowfield to melt human population growth multiplied by human consumption mm -hmm. so those are our biggest mm -hmm. problems human population size and growth multiplied by human consumption, not just human population size. That, that family in a village in, um, in, uh, Gor in uh, Mozambique that, that has six kids and they're living off of a little tiny cornfield and trying to protect it from elephants, they are not the problem. Oh, they've got six kids, but they are not the problem because they're consuming very little. They're consuming less than a middle-class family in Joburg or in Bozeman, Montana is consuming. Mm -hmm. So it's population growth with each child added to the planet and the amount that that child will consume in a lifetime that is feeding those three rivers of trouble. Uh, it's very unpopular when you're asked by an audience of young people uh, who ask, um, what should we do? What can we do about this problem? It's very unpopular to say, well, don't have children. Mm -hmm. How do you say that? How mm -hmm. do you say that? Um, but I say what I've just said. Think about it. Think about whether this planet needs more children. And if so, how many and how much are they going to consume? That's what um, will determine whether 100 years from now, 
this planet has any polar bears in the wild, any lions in the wild, any lowland gorillas in the wild. That's what will determine whether that that happens or or whether those creatures are lost. What about value, David? Value associated with the wildlife that people live with? Well, there has to be value, of course. Mm -hmm. They have to be valued. And, and we have to educate people to care, to care about the existence of polar bears, to care about the existence of, of a great diversity of beetles in the Amazon, to care about um, the existence of California condors. You know, it's not just big predators. Um, it's not just game animals. It's all forms of biological life. And it's in some ways, it's probably easier to get people to care about polar bears and giant pandas, of course, and these, these you know, these iconic uh, charismatic creatures. It's easier to persuade people to care about them and value them, whether you're doing it by way of the hunting economy and the hunting um, framework of valuation, or whether you're doing it in some other way. It's easier with with the big dramatic creatures than it is with those those beetles, those diverse species of beetles and of, of ants um, and of rodents mm -hmm. and of birds of prey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the business that you and I are in. And right. uh, well, I um, we've got a lot yeah. of work to keep doing and I'm and, and I'm an old guy and you're a young guy. So you need <laughs> to keep doing it after I kick the bucket. No, we we'll, we'll certainly are on the same track in terms of what we are passionate about, which is, you know, wild places with wild people with wild creatures. Um, and so yeah. I, I much appreciate the time, David, and uh, I look forward to us continuing to get to know each other. And um, yeah, good luck in Mozambique. I love Mozambique. I'm actually, um, I'll give you a little bit of a tidbit. We're actually going to do a massive project in Mozambique this year. And we're relocating cheetahs uh, from Namibia into a place in Mozambique that's protected through hunting, but cheetahs will never be hunted. Um, so it's a pretty big project. I've raised a bunch of money for it already. Uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, actually. Um, Good on you. We're going to splash it everywhere. I'll watch for that. I'm very interested in that. Yes, and I promise, I promise you one other thing, Robbie. Yes, sir. Um, next time I meet an Australian, I'll say to him, <laughs> so... Are you from South Africa? Nice. I love it. You can you have you you have a debt to pay. You have a debt to recoup. Exactly. Granted. I I appreciate you. Okay, man.